Today we're going to discuss two writers, <coughs> Mary Estelle and Afra Bain. Mary Estelle lived from 1666 to 1731, your book tells you. That means that she was born one year before Paradise Lost was written. Her life generally paralleled the life of Daniel Defoe, who wrote Robinson Crusoe and 500 other works. He lived from 1661 uh, to 1731, and she lived 1666 to 1731. Pepys had written at least six years of his diary before she was born, so we place her in perspective. Your book gives you a brief introduction of Mary Estelle and tells her that she was committed to education, she was committed to the Church of England, and that she, to some extent, uh, was not as much an, an imperialist, uh, I'm sorry, as a, uh, uh, not so much a Lockean, not so much an empiricist as uh, others of the, of the philosophers of the time. The work we're looking at is a work that she produced called A Serious Proposal to the Ladies for the Advancement of Their Advancement of Their True and Greatest Interest by a Lover of Her Sex. It was published in 1694. Now she writes the letters to ladies because she wants them to get an education. It's possibly true that 95% of the women were unable to read or write. Many more men, of course, because they went to the schools. Actually, the population of Afghanistan today, they say, is 95% illiterate. And when you're illiterate, a few people can give you, tell you what to do, provide the judgments, and direct your course of action. It wasn't until 1739 when a printer by the name of Richardson published a book by, uh, called Pamela about a working girl. When we learned that so many women were interested in reading about the plights of a working girl, trying to make her way through society, that a million women learned to read. In a serious proposal to the ladies, Mary Astell proposes an academy for women. And specifically, she provi a, uh, provides an academy with that sequesters women by themselves against men. The greatest fault of her essay amongst the writers was that it seemed too close to the life of a convent and too close to the Roman Catholic pattern, and so uh, people generally were not were reluctant to accept what she said. But we're going to look at some of the points she makes in this proposal in the uh, first half hour of this course, and then we'll move on to discuss another writer, Afra Bain. If you look at Mary Estelle's writing style, it is elegant, but not overly done. She begins by saying this, since the profitable adventures that have gone abroad in the world have met with so great encouragement, though the highest advantage they can propose is an uncertain lot for such matters as opinion, not real worth, give a value to. Things which have obtained are as fitting and fickle as that chance which is to dispose of them. I therefore persuade myself you will not be less kind to a proposition that comes attended with more certain and substantial gain, whose only design is to improve your charms and heighten your value by suffering you no longer to be cheap and contemptible. 
She says women should no longer suffer themselves to be cheap and contemptible. Its aim, she says her proposal, its aim is to fix that beauty, to make it lasting and permanent, which nature with all the helps of art cannot secure, and to place it out of the reach of sickness and old age by transfer, transferring it from a corruptible body to an immortal mind. Now, when she says she wants to transfer from a corruptible body to a permanent of the mind, what is she saying other than that women are prized for their beauty, women are prized for their looks, women are prized for the way they serve men, and when they get old, they really have little left. No beauty. And nothing more than to dress well and prepare meals well. But she says the body can be corrupted. This, of course, is biblical. Ultimately, the body will co be corrupt and go to the grave. Gulliver's Travels deals with the whole issue of the corruption of the body in the fourth book of Gulliver's Travels, when we deal with the yahoos. What lasts, she said, is not the body, is not your beauty. It is your knowledge, your intelligence, what you have absorbed, and what you can convey. What are some of the arguments she offers in this proposal? Let's look at a few of them and see to what extent she is advancing the cause of women. First of all, this essay is in two parts. You don't have all the parts in your book, but you certainly can go to the library and search them out. Part one says, among other ideas, or states among other ideas, that women ought not need to satisfy men's whims. Men seek to keep women, she says, as ignorant as themselves. So she's not being complimentary to these men or to the world of mankind that keeps women uneducated. And she says, the soil is rich and would, if well cultivated, produce a noble harvest. To draw your equation and make the earth metaphor is not new. Uh, women are, represent Mother Earth. And if you enrich this earth, then you will enrich the production. The Bible says fields must lay fallow every seven years so that the soil can re-enrich itself. Why, she says, are women kept ignorant? Custom alone suppresses women's capabilities. Now this is what I've said before, or mentioned before, is the the theory of plenitude, P-L-E-N-I-T-U-D-E, -E, plenitude. Plenitude is the theory that states that wherever you are on the great chain of being, at whatever level you exist, your job is to be best at that level that you can possibly be. The theory of plenitude says that if you are of a lower caste, then you do your job before God's world as the best in that caste can do. And what Mary Estelle is saying here is that women have a certain capability. It is less than that of men, and therefore they should perform the duties that they are obliged to perform, and to perform them as well as they can, to dress well, to cultivate the home, to entertain the men, to satisfy the men's need for procreation, to produce family. This is the woman's role. And as long as you believe in the theory of plenitude, you'll say that's all they need and that's all they should do. There are nations in this world today that do believe in the theory of plenitude. Women are not to be in government. Women are not to be educated. They are simply to service the role. And if they service that role, extremely well, they will 
perform uh, to divine expectation. What are women supposed to be involved with, according to men? Women are accustomed to fashion, value, and uh, clothes more than religion. Robert Burns, later on, has a poem called To a Louse, where a woman goes to church, and she's more interested in showing off her Lenardi fashions than she is in listening to the minister worship. There are clothing stores in this city where... Multitudes of hats are turned out for the Easter season because people want to go into church dressed well and dressed new. And this becomes a priority, not necessarily the sermon. She says, however, that ignorance and narrow education lays the foundations of vice. She says, women who value nothing but their clothes discount piety, discount religion, and she was an avid uh, churchwoman. She said, if you put women in a monastery to learn, you withhold from them temptation. And this, of course, is one of the premises of uh, no marriage and the separation of the sexes in schools. What do education... She says, among other points, an educated person need not pursue multiple languages. Uh, if you know one language well, read well, you're going to understand what the world is about. But to some extent, she's somewhat ironic, because men are expected to know multiple languages, but not women. There are, however, a few well-chosen books requisite for learning. The Bible is one of them. The Book of Common Prayer is another. Um, not the classics in this sense. We'll talk about that in, in a moment. Truth rests, she said, in a thorough grounding in the doctrine of the Church of England. Now again, I keep reminding you, there's a reason why thousands, tens of thousands of people left England and Europe to come to America during this period because they have people like Mary Estelle and Churchman saying that only those who practice the single sect of the Anglican Church can hold government positions and can, in fact, uh, attend the schools. Mary Estelle says, we can learn without learning Greek. Education does not depend on Greek or Latin nor on Aristotle untranslated. Let's see Aristotle translated. Let's read the texts without the interruption and without the mediation of having to learn Greek. She says wisdom requires more than reading novels or attending plays. Now, <clears throat> let me mention this. Romances in her period, romances in her time, novels, were considered stories that women would read. They're always romantic tales that end happily. Uh, there are hundreds and hundreds of romances written at this time. Later on, when Richardson writes a book called Clarissa, and her family wants to punish her because she won't marry the man that they select, they remove from her room all the romances that she has been reading all the novels. Play going is another art. You go to a play, you sit in a box, and you show yourself off if you're a woman, and you take the pleasure from the play you can derive, particularly if the play deals with problems of a, uh, marriage, infidelity, and love. Uh, some women went to, play, went to plays and would wear patches. You wore patches on your face to hide blemishes. Uh, the journalists claimed that party patches sometimes indicated whether you were Tory or Whig. If you wore the patch on your right side, you were Tory, which is conservative. If you wore the patch on your left, on your, uh, your left side, you were 
liberal, which would be Whig. She said, in fact, women need practical knowledge. Women need practical knowledge. Why shall it be thought, she said. Why shall it not be thought? As genteel to understand French philosophy as to be a coutard in a French mode. So we all want to wear French dresses. Our husbands want us to be dressed in the latest Gallic style. But why shouldn't we also be reading Descartes? And why shouldn't we also be reading a, uh, the great French philosophers? She said one needs to balance the time spent between the body and the soul. Robert Burns, the Scottish poet at the end of the century, would say, how are the body and soul getting along? Like husband and wife, I suppose. Always arguing with each other. But Mary Estelle, long before Burns, says there must be an accommodation of the body and soul. The monastery, she says, offers the opportunity to develop, to develop friendships. A blessing which, next to the love of God, is the choicest jewel in our celestial diadem. Among all the riches we have, having friends is as important as being friendly with your God. Now, what are the advantages of an education? <clears throat> She goes on to mention, among other events, that heiresses can avoid fortune hunters who are rapacious vultures. If you were a woman and you came from a wealthy family, you did not inherit any property. The property always went to the eldest son in the next generation. Your husband gained access to your property only for the rents, but he didn't own the property. That stayed with your family. If, however, you had a male son, then your estate would pass from your, your family into the estate of your male son. Fortune hunters would look to marry women who had great estates to ultimately gain the estate through their male son. Of course, in many cases, if a woman married a wealthy man and he died, then she had the perfect right to maintain and to take care of his affairs throughout her lifetime until she passed away and the estate reverted to her family. In part two of a serious proposal, and there's nothing to underestimate what she thinks. She's serious all the time, except when she's sarcastic about men. Part two is an attack on men. She says, male critics are generally incompetent judges. What makes them, she says, competent to judge our behavior, our conduct, and the kinds of education we should receive. She doesn't wish to displace men. What does she say? They may busy their heads with affairs of state and spend their time and strength in recommending themselves to an un uncertain master or a more giddy multitude. An uncertain master may be the king who becomes fickle and he gets rid of people he doesn't want, he retains people he desires. Our only endeavor, she said, shall be to be absolute monarchs in our own bosoms. Now, to be your own ruler, to be your own governor, to be in charge of your affairs is fairly difficult in this time for many reasons. Number one, uh, Women were expected to have children. You needed a lot of children. I mentioned to you that Queen Anne had almost 16. Because half of them would die by the age of nine. You had no vaccines. You had no ways of warding off 
polio, measles, or other childhood diseases. So women who are constantly pregnant, women who are constantly trying to satisfy their husband's desire for an heir, women who are trying to desperately maintain their family alive, did not have as much time for education, did not have as much time for learning as one would assume. The 20th century has changed all that when Mary Estelle says, our only endeavor shall be to be absolute monarchs in our own bosoms. The 20th century has come out with a device that allows women to govern their own lives and to control their birth rate. And that is what? The, the birth control pill that came in the 1960s has changed the perception and psychology of the world. <clears throat> The printing press changed the psychology of the world when it allowed for the widespread dissemination of information and led to democracy. <clears throat> the steam engine changed the philosophy of the world because you no longer needed large families. You could, in fact, operate and run your farms on much smaller families running machinery. And if you go to the law schools or you go to the medical schools and you look at their classroom photographs in the 30s and the 40s and the 50s, you may see one or two women sitting in those classes. Today, when you look at the photographs of law school and medical school classes and other graduate programs, you'll see as many as 50%. And today, I think... Uh, the majority of people in medical school classes today uh, are women. Mary Estelle tells us that our only endeavor shall be to absolute, be absolute monarchs in our own bosoms, and it took the 20th century to finally fulfill her, uh, her uh, uh, suggestion. She says, men shall still, if they please, Dispute about religion. Let him only give us leave to understand and practice it. Now, if your religion is something that you have studied, if you've read the Bible, if you've read the theological tracts, if you have read the philosophers, and then arrive at judgment, then your religion becomes more fulfilling, certainly more intellectually based. And she is saying that all they want us to do is go to church and listen to the sermon and obey what is said. But what we want to do is read it, understand it, and practice it based on our acquired knowledge. <clears throat> Mary Estelle is not the only woman writing in this period. Uh, Several years ago, I was at the British Museum and met a woman who was studying Puritan diaries, Puritan women's diaries. Women in England and women in America writing their diaries, but none of them were published. This work was published. There are some favorite quotations from this work. When she mentions friendship, and she says, friendship to human beings is the greatest diadem as well as friendship to God. She says, by friendship I do not mean anything like those intimacies that are abroad in the world, which are often combinations in evil, and at best but insignificant dearnesses, as little resembling true friendship as modern practice does primitive Christianity. She's talking about a high, higher level of understanding. She says, If any object against a learned education, I'm sorry, if any object against a learned education and say that it will make women vain and assuming, and instead of correcting, increase their pride, I grant that a smattering in learning may do so. 
for it has this effect on men. So she reverses the image and she says, let those who claim that I'm going to become vain and prideful because I've learned more only recognize that they themselves are vain and prideful not because they've learned more but because their learning has made them appreciate it less. She has some reflections upon marriage. She offers the, expand, the example of Hortense Mancini, the Duchess of Mazarin, forced to marry an odious person. Women are forced into marriage for family ties, and they have to become more independent. They have to have husbands who will want them to read and who will share with them their ideas. She says a silly marriage is based upon money, wit, or beauty. What she wants is a marriage based on compatibility, association, knowledge, mutual respect. A sound marriage, she said, is based upon prudence. She says, people who are ill-natured never improve. Ill nature sticks to him a man from his youth to his gray hairs. And a boy that is humorous and proud makes a peevish, positive, and insolent old man. Again, she's saying, even with education and with a right to education, with prospects of education without any bars to education, Men have pro proven themselves to be insipid and foolish. And we can have the same right. But she said we also need the right to improve our minds and improve our knowledge and ex expand our knowledge. She says a man dissatisfied with his marriage can find numerous outlets for his energy. He can go to the bar or he can find other women. A woman is confined to the home. If a man maintains uh, infidelities, no one knows. If a woman maintains infidelities, if she becomes pregnant, then it becomes obvious. But I've already mentioned to you that Mary Estelle is looking for knowledge and independence. She's not looking for liaisons based on beauty or love or ephemeral matters. She makes another statement here, which is really important politically as well as in terms of women's rights. Obedience to authority makes for an uncertain relationship. If you do everything an authority tells you simply because you are required to do so, simply because you expect to do so, and simply because the authority requires you to do so, then you've lost your independence. And you've lost the capability to be a better woman. She said, too often a prudent marriage leads to a subservient estate, a subservient state. And finally, sarcastically, she says, have not all the great actions that have been performed in the world been done by men? Well, that's because we only report the actions of men. Now, of course, she makes that statement knowing about Deborah in the Bible. She makes that mistake knowing about Miriam in the Bible. She makes that statement knowing about Queen Elizabeth. She makes that statement knowing about the power of women behind the rulers. And so she's giving us a off-sided comment in this sarcastic statement. And of course, women bear the men who perform these great deeds. What is the effect of a poor education? She said, for though all men are virtuosi, philosophers, and politicians, in comparison of the ignorant and illiterate, illiterate women, yet they don't all pretend to be saints. 
And it is no great matter to them if women who were born to be their slaves be now and then ruined for their entertainment. So when men will take women, use them, discard them, and fail to give them the advantages they need in order to maintain independence in society. She says, in the age of sin, men select wives according to their appetites rather than their reason. And then she recognizes the Lockean theory of governance. Remember I told you the double contract theory? The king may rule by divine right, but his obligation is to fulfill the will of the people. And so she says, sovereignty, sovereignty of government is not absolute. Why should it be so in the home? Why can't you have a shared relationship and a relationship where knowledge and the right to knowledge and the right to read and the right to express one's views ought not be accorded women as well as men? She says that authority may be preserved and government kept inviolable without that nauseous ostentation of power which serves to no end of purpose or purpose but to blow up the pride and vanity of those who have it. If men are in power and they feel that's where the power should lie, she says that is a nauseous, ostentatious attitude. It's pretentious. It's officious. It is undesirable. And we need a world better balanced. What do men do, she said? They engage in war. Their vast minds, she says sarcastically, lay kingdoms waste. War and peace depend on them. They form cabals and have the wisdom and courage to get over all the rubs, the petty restraints which honor and conscience may lay in their way. Now, honor and conscience are not petty restraints. These should be major restraints. But she says, for the men who wage war and attack on their own, these are petty considerations. What is it they cannot do? They make worlds and ruin them. Form systems of universal nature and dispute eternally about them. And finally she says, if all men are born free, how is it that all women are born slaves? Well, we're talking about a woman who's writing in 1690. We're, not, we're only 90 years away from the statement that all men are created equal, that we have inalienable rights to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. At the same time, a constitution is written that fails to give women the right to vote. And so the battle continues. But there are women like Mary Estelle who are expressing their opinion. And you're going to find throughout the 18th century more and more women having the opportunity to publish. And of course, when you go into the 19th, into the 19th century, women become major writers and major novelists. If any of you has comments about anything we've said today, well, I'm anxious to hear what you think. You may think that Mary Estelle is very radical in her statement. The most radical part of her statement is confining women to a monastery or a convent to learn and to be educated. And this is what the Anglicans and her people generally rejected because it was too close, as I said, to Roman Catholicism to separating women and men and having them pursue separate ends. 
Those of you who wish to write critical papers or other papers on uh, Mary Estelle, feel free to do so. There's a lot more we can say and far more productivity in her essays than we've stated here today. We're going to now move to another writer, and that's a woman by the name of Ephra Bain. Let me call this up in a moment. We'll have it. Afro Bain is a major English writer. She wrote in her time, and people knew who she was. She's been considered a major writer in English literature for many, many years. This is not a newfound writer or a newfound name. She was the daughter, as far as we know, although we don't know a lot about her, of... Uh, Thomas Culpepper's wet nurse, and she was a daughter of a barber in Wye, says Anne, Countess of Winchelsea, who was a poet. The daughter of a barber. Barbers are famous in literature. We'll have a chance sometimes to look at them because barbers have all knowledge. Barbers know everything because they hear what their customers say. And they repeat it. Edward Phillips called her a modern poet in a collection of works called the Theatrum Poetarum. In 1684, she published poems upon several occasions. And she actually published and wrote 17 plays. She's a major playwright. If you take a course in restoration of 18th century drama, you will study the plays of Aphra Bain. Her first play was The Forced Marriage in the Duke of York's Theater in 1670. She wrote prologues to plays that are statements beginning plays. She wrote epilogues, which are statements that actors recite after plays. And she wrote various commendatory verses, verses of praise for major playwrights, playwrights like Ravenscroft, Nicholas Rowe, Thomas Otway, Nahum Tate. She was very much involved in the theatrical scene as a playwright as a writer, as a woman who, whose views were sought, whose writing was published, and whose plays were acted and produced. And you can become quite wealthy as a playwright in the 18th century, in the Restoration period, just as you can become quite wealthy as a producer of plays on Broadway today. But we don't know a lot about her. In fact, some of her background we're not sure about. She seems to have been a spy, and she spied for the English crown in Holland. Now, her story, Orinoco, takes place in Suriname. And if you remember, the Dutch wars in the Restoration period ultimately gave Suriname, which was under the English, to the Dutch, and the Dutch, in return, gave New Amsterdam to the English, which they renamed New York. What are some of the major historical events in her later life? Um, well, she certainly served under James II. And here we have some major historical events. The Treaty of Breda ended the Second Anglo-Dutch War in 1667, where Suriname was ceded to the Dutch. 
1667 is always a memorable year. That's the year Paradise Lost was written and the year uh, that Jonathan Swift, the author of Gulliver's Travels, was born. I mentioned to you before when we discussed Absalom and Kittafel, that the Duke of Monmouth, Monmouth was defeated at Sedgemoor on July 5th, 1685, and he was executed after a meeting with James II on July 13th. Sir Isaac Newton's math uh, uh, Mathematica appeared in 1687. During her lifetime, the state of Pennsylvania in the United States was founded, or in America was founded, in 1688. John Locke wrote his essays concerning toleration in 1689, 1690, and 1692. And among all the writers who are going to study this period, Aphrobane seems to be the one who best sought the idea of toleration. I mentioned to you that John Locke felt that various religious sects should be allowed to live together in peace, in harmony, without <clears throat> attacking each other. He had, again, a, although no toleration for the Roman Catholic Church, because he said that was allied to political powers, France and Spain. Occasionally, you've gone to a... Uh, to games with people of street, Sir Charles Sedley, and a friend of Nell Gwynne, mistress of the King Charles II, streaked up and down the streets of London during this time. During her lifetime, Alexander Pope was born in 1688. But the thing I want to emphasize most about Aphra Bain is the fact that she was an accepted writer amongst all the writers uh, during that time. We're going to now spend some time today and our next session dealing with Efferbane's novel, Orinoco. Orinoco deals with a slave captured in Ghana, captured from his land, Coromantian, and taken to Suriname when it was under the English. Aphrobain apparently was in Suriname, and either she actually saw a man, a prince enslaved in Suriname, or she wrote a story dealing with the subject and using Suriname as its setting. In either case, she inserts herself into the story so that she, as the narrator, actually meets Orinoco, sees him being treated by the English, and sees the way he has met uh, the exigencies and the suffering of slavery. I'd love to mention a few things about the whole issue of slavery before we begin, just so we have some idea what the times were like and what this book is dealing with. English slavery was basically based in Barbados, colonized by the English in 1627. By 1640, the colony was producing tobacco, cotton, ginger, indigo, and other crops for export, with a labor force composed of indentured servants. An indentured servant was someone who had to leave England or had a native country and agreed to come to a foreign country, come to the Caribbean or come to Bar 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 Barbados on the condition that he could work off his transportation and his payment over a seven-year period or whatever period he was contracted for. So an indentured servant was a person who put himself into a position of servitude, but who would be freed once he paid off his way. 
1660, however, the working force consisted, consisted mainly of African slaves. What happened was it was discovered that the average indentured servant would work for about 220 pounds a day. But a slave could be fed and kept at half that cost. So imagine the sudden economic strength you received when you maintained a thriving tobacco business and could increase your profits 100% by reducing your costs 100%. Slaves could be fed at 131 a day and indentured servants at 220 a day and you made a lot of money. In fact, the hundred richest per the hundred newest rich Englishmen during the 17th century were involved in the slave trade. From 1672 through 1713, the Royal African Company, which was the company established for a uh, transportation of slaves, delivered an estimated 100,000 slaves to the English West Indies, nearly half of whom were sold in the Barbados. The English, all right, <clears throat> When a Barbados merchant, when a merchant in Barbados discovered that Caribbean rum sold much better than English brandy on the African coast, the slave trade even increased more. Now let's look at these slave auctions. There are always two auctions. The first auction would be slaves who were stronger, healthier. The second auction will be slaves who are weaker. <clears throat> Here is the price of slaves in the Barbados in the 18th, 17th century. In the year 1677, a male slave went for 18.55 pounds. Now, that would mean $36 times 8 about $280 times, about $2,800 in today's money would be the cost of a male slave. There are 131 slaves <clears throat> in a, uh, auctions in the Barbados in 1677. Women sold at about three quarters the price. At 1612, and in this one slave auction, we had 43 women sold. Boys, teenagers mainly, were at a higher price than the women at 1746, and there are 22 of them. And girls sold at 11.23 pounds, and there are 16 of them. The price was high in 1701. Male slaves were bringing in f almost 40 pounds. That's $80, 640 times 10 is $6,400. So the inf inflation tripled the price and the cost of slaves by the year 1701. Now, when you begin looking at these figures, you find that there's a profit in selling slaves. But by 1680, the slave market was depressed. And the slavers in Barbados persuaded Americans in Maryland and in Virginia to use slaves on their plantations. So the slave trade expanded to America in the 1680s purely as an economic move. Now, one could become a slave under four circumstances. By birth, if you were born to a slave. By being purchased as a slave from a non-European. In Africa, you had these tribal wars. And when the one won over another and found he could make profits from Europe, then the a, a victorious tribe would imprison the men and women of the other tribe in forts until they could be picked up and purchased by the European traders, Portugal, England, and others. 
A third way was by being a non-Christian captured in war. You could become a slave. And a fourth way you could become a slave would be to be sentenced by the, judici by the courts uh, to slavery. Removing oneself from slavery in the first three instances required conversion to Christianity. The question, of course, was a very serious one, this conversion, because according to the Bible, if a slave is converted to religion, his soul is saved, he has to be freed in seven years. You cannot keep a slave more than seven years, biblically speaking. Well, that produced a dilemma for Englishmen who had paid $3,000 to $6,000 per slave. And the general thinking was that slavery was a moral and religious issue, so you had to convert the slaves. But suspending slavery was an economic issue. And this was up to the slaveholder to do on his own. So the English reconciled themselves to this dichotomy in which they observed saving the soul, but withheld the essence of freedom. There was an attempt of the Quakers to teach black slaves and to bring them to church. The government thought this was subversive. And on April 21, 1676, England passed a law preventing slaves from attending Quaker meetings and forbade the Quakers from instructing them. Quakers who permitted their slaves to attend church meetings could suffer penalties, including forfeiture of their slaves. So the government even prevented education prevented uh, slaves from gaining in education, even prevented slaves from being converted. And harsh laws against the Quakers in 1678, 81, and 70, 1723 reduced the Quaker population in the Barbados. No wonder William Penn was chose to move to America and set up Penn's Woods as a new state or a new community. There are some other statistics that are rather interesting, and that is one slave was equal to 3,000 pounds of tobacco. So the and what you have to realize, realize and understand is that slaves were not thought of as being human beings. They were thought of as being cargo. And they could be exchanged for cargo. One reality is this. We hear of many slaves perishing on these voyages. And we do have evidence that at some point as many as 600 slaves were, stuffed into, were crowded into a single boats. But part of the reality was that every captain earned a commission on his cargo. And so many captains would treat the slaves carefully, give them enough space to breathe in, so they didn't die in large numbers on the voyage overseas. Now, the truth of the matter was that there was a high death rate amongst white sailors, as well as among black slaves. But I feel that more captains probably were interested in maintaining the integrity of their product and their cargo, trying to reduce death as much as possible so that they could earn the dollars they needed when they brought the slaves to the Caribbean and to the Barbados. The slave trade is a very complicated issue. And if you're going to study it, there are various ways to study it. Uh, you're accustomed to going to various databases. Right, here we are. In 1640, an adult male slave was sold in Virginia 
at a price of 2,700 pounds of tobacco, equated 18 pounds, at an auction at St. Kitts in 1646, an adult male sold for 4,000 pounds of tobacco, a female for 3,000 pounds of tobacco. When you do research in this course for your paper, don't just check the literary databases. For example, if you want to study the slave trade, David Gallinson has an article called The Atlantic Slave Trade and the Barbados Market, which appeared in the Journal of Economic History. Richard Dunn has a book called Sugar, which way do I go? Richard Dunn, Sugar and Slaves, The Rise of the Planter Class in the English West Indies from 1624 to 1713. Richard Sheridan has an article called Sugar and Slavery, an Economic History of the, I'm sorry, that's the, the book, Sheridan's book, Sugar and Slavery and Economic History of the British West Indies. John McCusker has the rum trade and the balance of payments of the 13 continental colonies as a doctoral dissertation at the University of Pittsburgh. Philip D. Curtin has written a book, The Atlantic Slave Trade, a census. Two writers, I think they've won Nobel Prizes, Robert Fogel and Stanley Engerman, have written a book called Time on the Cross, The Economics of American Negro Slavery. So there has been a lot of work done in economic journals, economic texts, and you can broaden your perspective when you write papers for this class by looking at some of these psychological, economic, or other databases that you normally might not pay attention to. Now let's look at this novel that uh, Afrobain has written. The major characters in this novel. And you, uh, it's, it's nice that you've got the full text in your book. Afrobain, who finds yourself in Suriname. The king of Coromantian, who is 100 years old, still making love. His grandson is Orinoco. Orinoco is in love with Imanda, the daughter of a dead general. And the king decides he wants her for himself. So he takes her into his harem. And Orinoco has to reach her before the king consummates a love affair with Imanda. Onachal is a former wife of the king who wants to get even with him by allowing Orinoco into the harem. Aboan is Orinoco's friend. In order to sneak him into the harem, he is forced to make love to Onachal because she won't let him in unless she gets her desserts. We also meet the ship's captain who deceives Orinoco. The ship's captain is a man who brings Orinoco on the ship on the premise of looking over the slaves and then has Orinoco himself put in chains and turned into a slave. Treffrey, a Cornish gentleman from the island of Cornwall who is a uh, meets Orinoco when he comes to, to uh, Suriname. Tuscan is an ally of Orinoco. He is against slavery. And he's supposed to help Orinoco in his revolt against the slave masters. But Tuscan is worried of his, about his own family. He doesn't want to see them punished for the actions of 
the insurrectionists who want to do away with slavery on the island. Bayam is the British deputy governor on the island. He is an untrustworthy negotiator. He actually lived, he was a real person, and his reputation was known in London. So there are real characters and there are artificial characters in this particular novel. And the cross is really very, un is, is unclear, but it's all very effective as we try to discover what happens with Orinoco. Now, when Orinoco is made a prisoner, his name is changed to Caesar. When the Coromantian king discovered that Orinoco had made love to Imoendo before he could, he forces Orinoco out of the palace. Orinoco must go to war because he's the general of the armies. And then Orinoco is led to discover that Imoendo has died. In fact, she's been sold into slavery. And when Orinoco reaches Suriname, he finds Imoendo there, a slave under the name of her slave name, Clemen. And this becomes part of the, uh, the story. Now let's look at the key episodes in this novel because it is a compelling novel and uh, given enough time to read it, it's a relatively short novel but it's a powerful novel, somewhat of a melodrama. But we have here the voice of Aphra Bain who is sympathetic with Orinoco and who recognizes deception where it occurs. Now, what are the key episodes? First, we discover that the king who had 13 sons see them all killed in battle. 13 sons killed in battle. Orinoco's father, too, was killed in battle, which leaves Orinoco alone, the grandson, who rises to power as the general of the king of Coromantian's armies. Orinoco meets Imoenda and is in love with her, at which point the king usurps Imoenda. Now, can this happen today? I've had African students in my class, that is, who have come here from uh, the various nations of Africa, and they said, yes, in Africa today, the tribal leader is chief paramount and oligarch. And if he had wanted someone else's woman, it would happen even today. There are a thousand different languages spoken in Africa and as many different tribes. And while we look at it as, as, as we look at these as separate nations, they are actually conglomerates of these tribes where tribal loyalty is very much more important in most instances than state loyalties. Orinoco sneaks into the king's harem, consummates his love with Imoenda. The king then tells Orinoco that Imoenda has died and commissions Orinoco to oversee some of these slave ships being sent out. Now understand again, prior to the Portuguese who instituted modern slavery, uh, the African tribes when they engaged in war would assimilate the tribe of their enemy, bring them into their tribe, bring them into worship their gods, possibly kill a large number of the warriors, and bring them in. Once the slave trade became affected, it became profitable for these African uh, chiefs to sell their enemies. Now, Coromantium is a very, very advanced 
kingdom. The king, the king has marble baths. The king has palaces. This is not a primitive environment that we're looking at. Now, whether Aphrobain imposed England upon Cor Coromantium, we're not, we're not sure. But uh, there's evidence that there's a highly sophisticated society here. Orinoco then walks on the ship as the prince, as the son of the grandfather, to see the slaves who are being shipped out. And he is overpowered and put in chains. The, Indian, the, the, the Africans on the ship who are in chains recognize Orinoco as their prince and their leader. They're shocked that he has been forced into their situation and they refuse to work and refuse to eat unless Orinoco's chains are removed. And the captain has to make that concession if he wants to relieve himself of the possibility of a slave rebellion. Finally, these are just brisk episodes. We're going to get into them a little bit more uh, fully. When Orinoco arrives in Suriname, he arrives with the premise that he will be freed and his dignity as the prince will be understood. But he, in fact, is kept in chains and he is renamed Caesar and finds himself in slavery. At that point, he discovers Imuenda. And to all extent and purposes, he and Imuenda become husband and wife because they've already consummated their love. And on this, in Suriname, she will become pregnant. There are hunting episodes. How do you use a prince? How do you use a warrior? You help him hunt. He uses his wiles. He uses his native ability to lead hunts. So he becomes a subject and the leader of entertainment for the English and Dutch residents of Suriname. That reminds me of a medical report not long ago that discussed the Plains Indians in America. 150 years ago, the Plains Indians were chasing buffalo and riding horses, and their metabolism was proceeding at a very high rate. I mean, it was at a high rate. Medical reports are that the metabolism of the Plains Indians over the last 150 years has not reduced itself. But now you have these Plains Indians on Indian reservations in a sedentary position where they cannot hunt, where they cannot move, and where the metabolism urges them to engage in this kind of activity. Consequently, the uh, uh, excessive alcoholism and the uh, excessive psychiatric problems you find on Indian reservations is to some extent by these medical authorities attributed to the fact that these Plains Indians no longer can conduct themselves the way they once uh, and uh, anthropologically were uh, consistently uh, supposed to do. Then we find out that Imuendo is pregnant. Orinoco is desperate. He does not want a child born into slavery. And of course, this is the premise for sustaining and retaining slavery, that if you're born to a slave, you're automa automatically a slave. You're not separated from the sins of your father or from the claimants of your father's masters. An insidious, uh, uh, horrible premise, but it exists in countries today where you have caste systems, well, you have, where today you have situations where people are enslaved in Middle Eastern or Far Eastern countries. If you're a slave and you bear a child, that child becomes a slave as well. And it, we have slavery in this world today. Orinoco delivers, uh, we have a button. Anyone who has a question and wishes to ask a question can now speak on the speaker on the desk. Press the button. If an indentured servant had a child, would that child be an indentured servant? No. No, because that was a separate con a contract between two people. No, not at all. Um, he would be under straits while the indentured servant was in servitude. 
but once the indentured servant freed himself, the child would not then have an obligation himself. Aronoko delivers a speech which is mindful of Cicero. This, and of course, Aphrobane had read the classics. And so this becomes a heroic speech urging these slaves to gain their freedom, to rise up against the slave masters. And he does garner large support of the slaves, but they begin to dissipate as they realize that they, they have to protect their families. Only Tuscan remains with Orinoco. The slave revolt then is a uh, dissipates with the desertion of the slaves. Orinoco is caught, he's punished, and he's whipped, humiliated. Orinoco desires revenge. He decides that he is going out now to seek revenge and to murder the taskmasters and slave owners and the governor of the certain and the British the British gov lieutenant governor who has perpetrated this indignity. But first he murders his wife Imoenda while she's pregnant so that she will not suffer slavery and so that their child will not enter the world as a slave. But he becomes so enervated by this breach of morality, he becomes so sickened by his own actions that he finds himself in a state of debility. And it is in this situation that the English find him. They accuse him of murder, and then they confine him uh, to a whipping post, to a stake, and first by dismembering him, and then by burning him, they kill Aranogo. Well, it's a very, very powerful story. But the story that garners great sympathy for slave, the slave great sympathy for Orinoco. If, as we said earlier, Mary Estelle said that the taskmaster requires subservience and reduces knowledge, then no less the slave master reduces subservience and prevents knowledge. Now, when we come in, Next time, we're going to try to study various aspects of Orinoco. I have a formula, which I've mentioned before. I'm going to mention again the Greases. Each letter stands for a theme. We're going to study Orinoco in terms of government, in terms of religion, in terms of economics, in terms of art and aesthetics in terms of science and technology, in terms of education, in terms of social behavior. And if, you, when you read Orinoco, you jot down what you think are examples of the way each of these themes, each of these motifs becomes an important part of the novel, we'll be able to have somewhat of discussion. For example, under government, if you look on the screen, you'll see that Coromantian is on the Gold Coast in an area today known as Ghana. Everyone is obedient to the war captain. And Orinoco finds himself in conflict with his government, with his grandfather, when the king desires Imoenda. The king realizes that he has robbed his grandson of a treasure, but he himself is concerned about succession.
when the deception occurs within Moenda, we still need Orinoco to manage the army. And this reconciliation between Orinoco and the government, in order to assume his role as general of the armies, becomes one of the initial conflicts of the one's role in government and one's duty to government in this novel. We'll discuss the novel at length in our next session. Thank you.